This is a brief review of the key works for Egyptian art in Art 101. We're going to start off looking at a pre-dynastic work, then go on and look at a few Old Kingdom works, and then move on to the New Kingdom. Uh, so all of these will be key works that are possibly on quizzes or can be brought up in midterms. Okay, so starting off with the Palette of Narmer, one of the most famous works of Egyptian art, uh, we see both the front right here and the back sides of the palette. This is a single piece of stone, a single slab of stone, and typically these palettes could be used to mix eye makeup. So this divot or depression right here um, could be a place for mixing coal or eye makeup to line the eyes because this was a way to protect the eyes from the intense sunshine in Egypt. Um, it was likely also thought to be beautiful. Uh, this palette, however, was probably primarily ceremonial because it is so decorated, probably on display, um, meant to promote the king that is represented there, and that's King Narmer, uh, whose name we know because of the hieroglyph here and here, so on both the front and the back sides. Um, starting off on the back side, you can see Narmer right in the center here. Uh, he's clearly an individual of high status. He's wearing a crown. This is the crown of Upper Egypt. He's holding on to a baton or some kind of weapon. He's about to smite or hit uh, the captive that he's holding below him. So clearly, uh, he is the man in charge. He has an individual serving him, holding on to his sandals behind him. Horus, the god Horus, is next to him. Or is the falcon here, um, who had special associations with the kings or pharaohs of Egypt, um, is represented here and demonstrating Narmer's control of Lower Egypt by this hieroglyph or symbol below uh, Horus. We also know that Narmer not only has the support of the god Horus, but also the goddess Hathor. So this is probably Hathor um, represented four times here, 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 and here. Um, she often was represented as a cow or with um, cow horns or as a composite figure. Um, so she was seen as the divine mother of the pharaohs, so she's represented up above in that upper register. Um, reaffirming the fact that Narmer is in charge, these additional captives in the lower register, also the fact that Narmer is wearing um, a kilt or a kind of garment that indicates his higher status, also the bull's tail here, which is a sign of status as well. Um, so, in addition to the Hathor heads on the front, and also the Narmer hieroglyph. There's also a Narmer wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. It scoops down low um, with his sandal bearer again, and he's being presented a number of bodies that are stacked up, one on top of the other. There's not really a sense of creating a naturalistic way of stacking bodies one on top of the other. You have bodies stacked with um, heads in between each of their legs. You can see the heads here, and you can see that each figure has been decapitated. Um, down below you can see feline figures with their necks intertwined, possibly a symbol of harmony between Upper and Lower Egypt. Narmer was a figure that was bringing together um, disparate parts of Egypt, bringing together Upper and Lower Egypt. This is why we often call it pre-dynastic, or some people call it early dynastic, because this is when the empire is really getting going. And then down below you have a symbol for Narmer as the bull, and he's crashing through uh, kind of an aerial view of a city. You can see the walls there, and then you can see an additional captive being crushed. And all these figures have similar uh, hairstyles, similar features, and they've all been stripped as a sign of their lower status, their status that is below the status of Narmer, of course, um, and those in his retinue. All right, so moving along. Just a few key terms here, uh, hieratic scale representing the size of things according to their importance. So Narmer clearly is the largest figure, he really is dominating the scene. Uh, on this side he's really filling up the entire register uh, also on this side. So hieratic scale representing the size of things according to their importance, and then a register, one of a number of bands or section into which a design is divided. So you can see there are three registers here, so one, two, three. And then you kind of have another half one over here, and then one, two, three, four. So those lines provide a convenient way of dividing up space and creating a logical sense of space. Okay. Um, so Hathor, as I said, she's the daughter of Ray. She's the divine mother of the pharaohs. And then another important uh, 
couple of important gods and a goddess. So Osiris is the lord of the underworld. Um, he was murdered by his brother Seth, and Osiris's wife was Isis. And then their son is Horus. So we just saw Horus as the falcon in the previous image. So Horus is the son of Osiris. He avenged his father's death by killing Seth and became king of Egypt, which is how he became so important for the pharaohs later on. Um, Osiris, however, is dominating the underworld. So uh, in life, when they're rulers, they very much like Horus. Um, in the underworld, when they're going to their tombs, they are definitely making a lot of offerings or representations of Osiris. All right, uh, how do we know how to read these hieroglyphs? That's an important question to bring up. Um, this is from the Rosetta Stone, so it's not just a software for learning different languages. Uh, the Rosetta Stone is actually a stone that has three different scripts, hieroglyphs, demotic, and then Greek. And uh, scholars knew how to read these two scripts, and so they were able to um, finally crack the code of hieroglyphs through the discovery of this stone. Um, so this was a very important discovery so that we can read a lot of the hieroglyphs in the Egyptian period. So it's important to note that this period has uh, writing that we can read, which differentiates it from the Neolithic and Paleolithic periods. Right here are just some representations of the crowns. So the crown of Lower Egypt, the crown of Upper Egypt, and then you often see the combined crown later on as we move into, for example, the New Kingdom in Egypt. So um, just keep this in mind as we move along. All right, so uh, probably the most famous monuments in Egypt are the Great Pyramids of Giza, um, created in the Fourth Dynasty, and uh, these were created for a single dynasty, a single family. Uh, Khufu's pyramid is the farthest away here. You can barely see it. Next is Khafre's with a little bit of limestone casing still at the top. And finally, Menkaure's here is the smallest. Uh, these are probably pyramids dedicated to Menkaure's wives or consorts. Um, they face east towards the rising sun, so you have this continual sense of renewal and rebirth every day. Um, they're symbols of the sun, resembling the Benben stone, which was an emblem of um, Heliopolis, which was the location of the cult and temple of Ra, or Re, um, the god of the sun. So the sun is very key to Egypt. A lot of ancient cultures have gods that are principal gods that are you know, symbolic of the sun or meant to... Um, control the sun. So that's very significant. Uh, also important to note is that these were not the first pyramids created. Um, there were a number of attempts kind of trial and error in order to finally get to this point. So for example, we see um, King Snefru before this this group of rulers, this group of pharaohs, um, who makes a number of attempts at pyramids that go awry. Um, but finally, once we get to the fourth dynasty and we see these pyramids really coming together as complete works. And these are just parts of very elaborate burial complexes. So there are temples that were attached to these. Um, these were not the only parts of the complexes. These were really cities unto themselves um, on the side of the river that tended to be dedicated towards death and burial. Um, so very elaborate tombs at a point when the pharaoh's power is quite substantial and they can direct these kinds of projects with very elaborate resources, very a lot of resources at their disposal. Uh, so Ra is this god who later merges with Amun. We see him as Amun-Ra, sometimes spelled with a U here, sometimes with an E here. Um, this is the supreme god, god of the sun, god that brought light to the world. Um, here we see the portrait of Khafre, so Khafre being the uh, pharaoh who had the, the pyramid in the middle. So if I just go back here, you can see it's this pyramid here. So this was part of that burial complex. You can see um, this was actually one of many, so this one is the most well preserved, so that's why we often study it in art history. You can see his body is very perfectly rendered, in great shape. Um, he's definitely an ideal god. His headdress covers his hair. Typically, pharaohs would not allow their hair to be shown. Um, he's wearing the false beard. Um, but he also shows that Horus, he has a connection to the divine. Pharaohs were considered god kings. So he has Horus just behind him here. And also plants along the side that show his control over various parts of Egypt. Um, he looks very firm and strong. There are representations of lions on either side of his throne. This one is damaged on the side. Um, but these were signs of power as well, so very significant in that sense. 
Um, we also have a representation of Menkaure and one of his wives. Uh, and you can see that Menkaure is clearly um, the main figure here. He looks very stoic, he looks very sturdy, same idealized body type, very strong that we saw previously with Khafre. Um, but we also see that his wife is very important. Typically these pharaohs would marry um, members of their family who also were considered to have this kind of god king divine blood uh, so his wife would also be very significant she's clearly a figure of support um, she's slightly behind him but she's almost as tall as he is so it seems that she has a significant role as well um, his masculinity is very much emphasized while her femininity seems to be emphasized through the tight garment that she's wearing uh, another work from the old kingdom is from a Mastaba, a tomb of an individual named T. He was a member of the elite class and the noble classes. Um, T is shown watching a hippopotamus hunt here. So we can see him watching the hippopotamus hunt and you can see the large hippopotami here, but also the fish are quite large. The scale seems to be slightly off. Um, and T here is represented as very calm, just kind of uh, enjoying this moment. He seems to be possibly already in the moment of the afterlife or he is kind of the director of this operation. Um, his figure is represented just like Narmer's that we saw in the palette, which is what we call a composite view. His shoulders are facing forward, his legs are in profile, his face are in profile. So we're getting kind of the optimal amount of visual information. We're getting a lot of information from seeing this um, by seeing all of these views together. Um, they seem to be in a densely packed uh, area on the water. You can see kind of the jagged waves of the water. If we look at this close-up over here, you can see how they kind of move back and forth. Um, so maybe this was an activity that T enjoyed during life, that he would continue to enjoy in death by it being represented here. Um, but he's also shown kind of as, as the director of the moment and also in a really peaceful state. Um, his body is represented as the largest in hieratic scale, and it's also represented in that composite view while we don't see that composite view when we look at these servants or individuals who seem to be carrying out the main physical labor of the hunt. So it's interesting that the artist chose to represent the bodies in different ways. Uh, seemingly, this composite view is associated with with an elite status, while this is associated with uh, a lower status. So um, just keeping that in mind as we move along. And the next video will go into the New Kingdom in Egypt.